Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar on what is the best treatment for heart disease. I am Dr. John Chan, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon at CVSKL Hospital. I would like to thank CVSKL Hospital for organizing this webinar, which I hope will be useful and interesting to you. I have prepared some slides which I hope will make this webinar more interesting and useful. So uh, let me share my, my slides. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. So in the next 30 minutes, I will share with you some insights on how the heart works, what can go wrong with the heart, how we can diagnose heart diseases, and how we can successfully treat it. I will go through the various treatment options available for some of the common conditions affecting the heart. Obviously, I won't be able to cover all the conditions affecting the heart in 30 minutes, but I will cover most of the important ones. Towards the end of the presentation, I will also cover very briefly some of the conditions affecting the lungs and chest which can present with the same symptoms as heart diseases. So uh, let's start with how the heart works. So the heart is essentially a pump which pumps blood around the body and it has its own blood supply. So the, the arteries which bring blood to the heart, which we call coronary arteries, uh, we have two on the left side. Uh, one here called the left anterior descending and one at the side called the circumflex and the other uh, on the right side called the right cor coronary artery. So all the blood returns to the heart through these two big veins. The heart pumps the blood out into the lungs where uh, oxygen is applied to the blood and then the blood returns to the heart and then it pumps again and then the blood leaves the heart through this big vessel here called the aorta. So one of the conditions which can go wrong is uh, coronary artery disease uh, that can occur uh, affecting the blood supply to the heart. So this is the coronary artery uh, inside the coronary artery and you can see in this coronary artery it is filled with uh, lipid and uh, on top of the lipid, a fibrous cap is formed. So this is what we call atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. And obviously, as you can imagine, the uh, blood flow to the, through these blood vessels will be reduced because of the narrowings of the blood vessels uh, in it. So if you have this condition, uh, you can present with chest pain and shortness of breath. These are the most common symptoms affecting uh, patients with coronary artery disease. A number of investigations we can do to diagnose coronary artery disease. So we can do a ECG. We can do this with you doing some exercise. So what we call a stress ECG and stress echocardiogram. Uh, we can do a coronary CT scan which gives more detailed information on the blood vessels supplying the heart and we can also then do a coronary angiogram. So typically we would start with just a normal ECG and perhaps uh, exercise stress ECG and uh, only if that is abnormal or we're not satisfied with the results and then we can go on to a coronary CT scan uh, and then uh, if that doesn't give us the information we need then we can proceed to a coronary angiogram. Uh, the reason for that is that the investigations get a bit more invasive uh, further down. So we always start with the least invasive investigation, which is uh, easiest to do and which will give us the information which we require. So this is an example of uh, a stress ECG. So the ECG is done with, with you doing some exercise uh, and we can see if there may be a problem with the blood supply to the heart. Uh, as in this example, it shows that in one region of the heart, the blood supply is not adequate uh, at peak exercise when the heart rate has increased, uh, in this case to about 150 beats per minute. So if we find this sort of abnormality, then we can go on to 
uh, a coronary CT scan. So this is an example of that. So to do this test, it is essentially a CT scan, but the difference is we inject some dye into a vein. And after that, images of the heart are taken. And this gives very detailed information about the coronary arteries supplying the heart. And from this, we can tell whether there's any uh, narrowings or blockages in the blood vessels supplying the heart. If we're considering further intervention, like putting a stent in or going for bypass surgery, then we would need to proceed to a coronary angiogram. Uh, this is a bit more invasive because we have to put a catheter into an artery either in your wrist or in the groin and then push this catheter up to the heart uh, right here. You can see there's a catheter here and then inject some dye directly into the coronary arteries. And then that shows it very well. So in this example, you can see uh, this artery here, what we call the left main stem is very narrowed. And then this artery at the front of the heart, this is actually the most important artery of the heart. You can see there's hardly any blood going through it uh, because of a uh, very bad narrowing there. And there's also a very bad narrowing there. So this would be the uh, uh, a more invasive sort of investigation which we, we, we can do to uh, uh, diagnose coronary artery disease. So the aim of any treatment for coronary artery disease, uh, firstly to improve your symptoms because uh, patients get very troubled with chest pain, what we call angina or shortness of breath. Uh, also to, more importantly, to improve your survival to help you to live longer and also to uh, reduce hospital admissions, to uh, reduce the need for you to uh, come into hospital because of uh, chest pain or, or heart attacks. There are several treatment options. In most cases, uh, most of the time, coronary artery disease is not very severe. It is only a very mild disease, and most of the time it can be successfully treated with just medications. Uh, if the coronary artery disease is a bit worse, then we have the option of putting a stent in or putting a balloon in, coronary angioplasty. Uh, for more extensive coronary artery disease, then we can offer coronary artery bypass surgery. So various medical treatments are available and there are various classes of medication. So, um, for example, we have the antiplatelet medication, medications which should thin the blood down and prevent heart attacks, such as aspirin, clopidogrel, and ticragolol. We have medications which will relax the coronary arteries and so uh, improve the symptoms of chest pain or chest discomfort, such, a, such as the nitrates and calcium antagonists. And then we have medications which will improve your survival to help you to live longer such as the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, and the ARBs. And of course, we have got medications to control the cholesterol, which, are the, which is the main risk factor for cor coronary disease. So we have the statins uh, as well. Uh, so this is the uh, stent. If the coronary artery disease is worse, if you are still having symptoms uh, with the medications, then we can put in the stent. So the stent is put into uh, the coronary artery and, and then it opens up uh, and then it pushes apart the, uh, the narrowing to allow blood to flow through the coronary artery disease. So this is a very good treatment uh, for patients who have uh, one or two narrowings of the blood vessels supplying the heart uh, because it can then give uh, symptom relief uh, very effectively. Uh, for more extensive disease, then uh, bypass surgery may be suitable. Uh, essentially, bypass surgery is like building a new highway to bypass all the old roads. So for example, this is the coronary artery, and in this case, there are a lot of narrowings and blockages involving uh, this blood vessel of the heart, and also involving this blood vessel, and also involving this blood vessel. So if there's a lot of coronary disease inv involving multiple vessels, then bypass surgery is a better option. Uh, and typically we would take a blood vessel from under the chest wall and some from either the arm or the legs uh, to, to then uh, bypass 
all the areas of the heart which has the narrow arteries. So on, on in this example, this artery is taken from under the chest wall and stitched onto this area so that it bypasses this whole area which is the problem area. And another blood vessel is taken from the arm or the leg to bypass this whole area. So you can think of the, this part of th as uh, the old road. Uh, this is the, the town where the blood needs to reach. So we've essentially built a flyover uh, or bypass to bypass all the congested roads so that the blood can reach the uh, area it needs to reach, it can reach the town. So the coronary bypass surgery has several aims to restore normal blood flow to the heart, uh, to prevent further heart attacks, uh, to improve your symptoms, and also to improve your, uh, your survival. So which is the best treatment? So uh, for very limited coronary artery disease, when the coronary artery disease is not too bad, uh, for example, if it involves just one or two coronary arteries and it does not involve the artery in front of the heart, then medical treatment is usually very successful. Uh, but if you continue to have symptoms with medical treatment, then coronary stenting would be useful to uh, improve your symptoms. Now, if you have more uh, significant coronary artery disease, uh, particularly if it involves the artery in the front of the heart and no narrows it by more than 70%, then medical treatment is still needed, but in this situation, coronary stenting would be beneficial as well. For even more extensive coronary artery disease uh, involving the, that main blood vessel in front of the heart, narrowing by more than 70%, and particularly if it involves multiple other coronary vessels, what we call multi-vessel coronary disease, then coronary artery bypass graft surgery uh, is the best option. So there, there are various treatment options depending on the severity of the coronary disease. Uh, the difference between stenting and coronary bypass, uh, stenting obviously will treat the lesion, uh, the culprit lesion, but it treats only a single lesion. Uh, and also it does not protect against future lesions if it should happen. Whereas bypass surgery, where because it bypasses the whole area which is at risk, uh, it not only treats the culprit lesion, but it protects against uh, future events as well. Because uh, even if another part of this artery gets narrowed or blocked, uh, it doesn't matter because that whole area has been bypassed. So uh, that is uh, an important difference between stenting and bypass surgery. Uh, and it is also the reason why bypass surgery is better if there is extensive coronary disease. But if there's limited coronary artery disease uh, in one or two places only, then coronary stenting is by far the uh, better treatment option. So uh, talking about bypass surgery, it is now nowadays a safe operation. For most patients, the risk of bypass surgery is about 1%. So 99% of patients uh, uh, have uh, go through bypass surgery very successfully. The uh, stenotomy wound which we do to do the operation is usually not a very painful uh, uh, wound. Most patients are okay with just paracetamol after a few days. Some will require stronger analgesia and this can be provided if needed. Uh, most patients will stay two nights in the intensive care unit and additional four to five nights on the ward. Uh, after a week, most patients can go home and they're quite okay. After four weeks, they can drive again. Uh, but the bone, the sternum takes up to three months to heal completely. So uh, patients should avoid carrying or pulling on heavy things for up to three months after the surgery. After three months, most patients will feel better compared to uh, before the, the surgery. Now, even though you have had bypass surgery, uh, the medications are still very important. So you still need to continue on the uh, medications uh, even after surgery. So for example, the antiplatelets to prevent uh, blood uh, clots, the aspirin is important. And nowadays we combine it with clopidogrel as well uh, for up to a year. And then control of the cholesterol is important, so the statins are important. And of course, uh, medications for the blood pressure and also for the heart. And control of diabetes is important if you are diabetic. 
And lifestyle changes or a healthy lifestyle is still important after bypass surgery. Uh, so regular exercise is important, a healthy diet, and definitely no smoking. Uh, patients who go back to smoking after bypass surgery will run into problems in future. So we always advise uh, patients not to start smoking again uh, after bypass surgery because then that will put the, uh, the new bypass grafts at risk. So it's important to maintain a healthy lifestyle uh, even after bypass surgery. If we compare uh, bypass surgery and stents and medical treatment, then those who have multivessel coronary artery disease uh, live the longest if they have bypass surgery. And this is one of the studies. There are numerous studies which have been published now. So this is one of them called the Syntex trial. And this looks at how long patients live after either uh, s bypass surgery or after stenting. So PCI is stenting, percutaneous coronary intervention. So this on the x-axis is the years, the number of years, and this is on the y-axis is the probability of death. So how many patients have died? And you can see the blue line are those who have had bypass surgery, and the red line are those who have had coronary stents. And you can see that over 10 years, uh, those patients who have bypass surgery, less of them have passed away compared to those who have had stents. So uh, those who have bypass surgery uh, definitely do a, a lot better. They live longer compared to those who have had coronary stents if they have three vessel coronary disease, meaning uh, three or more coronary vessels have got uh, coronary disease. And then this is uh, another study. This study combined all the studies which have been done comparing coronary stents against uh, bypass surgery. And you can see there are about 10,000 patients have been studied. And over five years, you can see again, the blue line are those who had bypass surgery and the red line are those who had coron coronary stents. And those who had bypass surgery, less of them have died at five years compared to those who have had coronary stents. So survival is better after bypass surgery in those who have multivessel or left main coronary artery disease. And the differences are even greater in patients who have diabetes. As we can see uh, in this study uh, involving 4,000 patients. So these are patients with uh, multivessel coronary artery disease who, who are diabetic. Uh, and you can see here that at five years, uh, those who had bypass surgery, less of them had died compared to those who had stents. So survival is better after bypass surgery, uh, and this is even more uh, evident in patients who are diabetic. So the take home message for coronary artery disease, medical treatment is best uh, if the coronary artery disease is not too, uh, not too severe. Coronary stenting can be considered for persistent symptoms with medications and for coronary lesions involving the artery in front of the heart. Coronary artery bypass graft surgery is the best treatment for more extensive coronary artery disease involving the artery in front of the heart and other coronary arteries. Bypass surgery offers the best survivor and symptom-free survivor, meaning uh, survivor without any symptoms of chest pain or breathing difficulties compared to coronary stenting or medical treatment in multivessel coronary artery disease. The benefits of bypass surgery is greatest in those with more severe coronary artery disease, abnormal function, and diabetes. So that's coronary artery disease. Uh, so we move on to a different condition called uh, heart valve disease. So if we uh, open the heart, if we, if, we, if we were to look inside the heart, so this is the heart open, you'll find that the heart has got four chambers, the left atrium, the left ventricle on the left side, and the right ventricle and right atrium on the right side. And separating these uh, chambers and also separating the big blood vessels which come out of the heart are valves. So we have here the mitral valve, which separates the, uh, essentially separating the heart from the lungs. It separates the left ventricle from the left atrium. 
Then we have got the aortic valve, which essentially separates the heart from the rest of the body. Uh, the, the aortic valve separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Then on the right side, you have got the tricuspid valve, which separates the right ventricle from the right atrium. And then we have the pulmonary valve, which separates the uh, right ventricle from the pulmonary arteries. So uh, things can go wrong with any of these valves. These valves can start leaking, uh, and then, or it can, may get very narrow, so it doesn't open it properly, and, and blood is uh, unable to flow through it. So if we go through, first of all, through to a mitral regurgitation, uh, which essentially means a, leak, a leakage of the mitral valve, which separates the heart from the rest of the body. So uh, this is the mitral valve. The, the mitral valve is essentially like two doors, and the two doors have to close uh, at exactly the right place. Uh, if one door closes uh, too much or goes in the opposite direction, as in shown in this condition, then there is a space here which results in blood leaking uh, to in the opposite direction. So one of the things that can go wrong is that the supporting structure which supports this valve can rupture. And this can happen, for example, just due to wear and tear with, with old age. Uh, and if this happens, then uh, blood will then leak in the opposite direction, what we call mitral regurgitation. Another condition which can happen is that there may be too much tissue. The door may be too big so that when it closes, uh, it doesn't close at the right place. So there are some gaps in between the two doors and, and then blood leaks uh, as a result. So this is uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, the mitral valve can also leak due to uh, weaknesses in the, uh, the heart muscle. So after a heart attack, for example, if the heart is not uh, contracting very well or if it is getting bigger, then it can pull the, the valve apart, like we see here, and this can result in uh, a leakage as well, what we call ischemic mitral regurgitation. So uh, the symptoms in this condition, uh, uh, patients get short of breath, they may get palpitations because over time, if it is left untreated, the patients uh, typically develop an irregu irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation and they may also develop anchor swelling. So the, uh, to diagnose this condition, we will do a heart scan, what we call an echocardiogram, which is essentially an ultrasound scan of the heart. We put some jelly on your chest wall and then we uh, pass the ultrasound probe on it. And this is an example of a patient. You can see uh, this is the mitral valve. And you can see this bit here, this bit is one of the supporting structure of the mitral valve which has ruptured and so you can see this jet this yellow jet is the the leak uh, so so blood is going in the opposite direction where it shouldn't be going and because of that it has caused this patient to get uh, more short of breath so the aim of treatment in this condition is firstly to improve the symptoms patients typically get short of breath and are unable to do what they normally like to do so one of the aims of treatment is to restore their, uh, set their quality of life back to uh, what, what it, what it normal, normally is. And then of course to improve their survival to back to normal and also to reduce hospital admissions to avoid patients needing to come into hospital because of heart failure. So there are various treatment options for these conditions. If the leakage is just mild or moderate in severity, then most of these cases can be treated with some medications just to get rid of excess fluid or to improve the heart function a bit. But if the leak is severe, then surgery will be needed because this is a mechanical problem. And uh, surgery to repair the mitral valve is the best option. And if it is not possible to repair the mitral valve, then surgery to replace the mitral valve uh, would be the recommended treatment. So if we look at what happens to, to patients, if we just treat this condition with medication and just don't do surgery, just leave it alone, over 10 years, you can see that 30% have developed what is called atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat. So then they would need to go on blood thinning medications. 
and this would affect also their quality of life. And then 60% would have gone into congestive heart failure, uh, so they were had difficulty with breathing, they are unable to do most of the things which uh, they normally like to do. 80% of the patients would have had needed surgery and 90% of the patients would have either died or have needed surgery. So in other words, this is a condition in which surgery will be needed uh, within 10 years. Uh, because it is a mechanical problem, uh, medication has only a limited role in terms of treating this, uh, this condition. But uh, we now know that the earlier we do surgery, the better the survivor for the patient, the longer the patient will live if we do the surgery earlier. So we can see from this study that over 20 years, uh, those patients who had surgery when they had no symptoms, so they were still quite well, but uh, we had diagnosed that they had a severe leakage of the mitral valve. If we did surgery at that stage, they lived the longest compared to patients who had surgery when they had mild symptoms and patients who waited until the symptoms were very severe and then only at that stage had surgery, those patients uh, did not live as long. So with this condition, uh, the earlier the surgery is done, the better. And that is because uh, if we do surgery early, the heart is still strong and had not got bigger. Uh, and so, in fact, if we do surgery early, we will restore the life expectancy of these patients back towards normal, back towards a normal, healthy uh, individual. And we now also know that uh, if we're able to repair the mitral valve, this is much better than replacing the mitral valve because the patients who had a valve repair again live longer compared to those who have the valve replaced. Uh, and this is because it is all your own tissue uh, and there's nothing artificial in it. In fact, you can see from this study that uh, those patients who had mitral valve repair lived the same as those who had no uh, underlying heart condition. So in other words, we are able to restore the life expectancy of the patient back to a normal uh, individual, back to a normal healthy patient. Uh, following a mitral valve repair surgery. There are various techniques to repair the mitral valve and this is one of them. So uh, in this case, uh, we are putting in new uh, cords or new supporting structures to re-support the mitral valve, what we call a neocorde mitral valve repair. And this is what we would uh, typically do uh, if the problem is one of the cords that ruptured, one of the supporting uh, cordae had ruptured. Uh, in those who have too much leaflet tissue, we can uh, repair the mitral valve by leaflet resection. So we resect the excess leaflet tissue so that the two uh, leaflets of the mitral valve would then close at the same place uh, and, and stop the leakage. And in addition, if the annulus is big, then we can suture uh, an annuloplasty ring or a new door frame uh, onto the, the, the valve. To, to restore its normal shape and size. Uh, we normally do this anyway in most cases of mitral valve repair to stabilize the, the, the mitral, what we call the mitral annulus or the frame of the, the mitral valve. So the take home message for uh, mitral regurgitation, patients with severe mitral regurgitation will benefit from surgery. The earlier the surgery is performed, the better the survivor Mitral valve repair is better than valve replacement uh, whenever this is possible. In most cases of uh, degenerative mitral regurgitation, in 95% of cases uh, where the problem is uh, wear and tear or of a ruptured cord, for example, in most of these cases, uh, we can successfully repair the mitral valve and there is no need to replace the mitral valve. Uh, but in cases due to what we call rheumatic heart disease, where the, the mitral valve is very diseased, is very what we call fibrous and narrowed, then uh, we may need to replace the, the mitral valve in those cases. So uh, this is a book I've written. Uh, you could uh, read that if you're interested, but it's written for, for doctors, so you would need some basic understanding of of uh, medicine and the heart to understand it. 
uh, but if you're interested, uh, everything I've said is, uh, is in this book, uh, which has been published. Uh, we will go on to aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis, uh, just to remind you, uh, the aortic valve is this main valve which separates the heart from the rest of the body. Uh, and this valve can get very diseased. Uh, it can get very narrow with lots of calcium deposits over the years. Uh, and it can prevent the, the valve from opening. Uh, and it can also leak. This valve can also leak uh, in some people and, uh, and give the same problems as the, as the mitral valve. So unfortunately with the aortic valve, we are, uh, it's not so good to repair the aortic valve. It is better to replace the aortic valve with a new valve. And so what we can do is we can uh, remove the diseased valve and then we can suture a new valve in place to replace the, uh, the diseased aortic valve. So patients with uh, aortic stenosis, typically they get very short of breath. Uh, they can get also chest pain because in this condition, because the blood is unable to leave the heart, very often not enough blood is able to flow to the coronary arteries. So these patients can present as if they have got coronary disease. They can get symptoms of uh, chest pain. And they can also uh, faint. They can also lose consciousness uh, because there's not enough blood reaching the, the brain and the rest of the body. This condition is quite serious because as you can see here, uh, so this on the y-axis is the percentage of patients surviving and this on the x-axis is the number of years. And you can see that once symptoms develop, symptoms of chest pain or fainting episodes or shortness of breath, if we don't do anything, then you can see the patient very rapidly de uh, deteriorate and they pass away within a few years. So this is a condition which uh, really we cannot wait once we have diagnosed it and once the patient has got symptoms, we really have to do uh, a valve replacement uh, quite, quite soon. And so if we compare those who have valve surgery, valve replacement surgery, uh, with those who have no surgery, we can see that this is survivor, how long the patient lives. You can see the great difference that those who have valve surgery will live a lot longer than those who do not have surgery once they are diagnosed with, with this condition. So uh, th there, are num there are two types of valves we can use. One is a tissue valve made from animal, animal tissue, uh, usually in this country made from cow tissue, uh, bovine uh, heart valves. And uh, uh, this is an example of uh, a tissue heart valve. Uh, the, the, these valves do not last uh, forever. They, they have a limited durability because of the wear and tear. Uh, if we put it in a patient 70 years and above, we can see here uh, in most of these cases up to 15 years the valve is still good. Uh, so usually in patients, in the older patients, those who are above 70 years of age will recommend a, a tissue valve. Uh, but if we put this valve in a younger patient, for in those, for example, who are 50 years of age, you can see that the valve do not last at long, as long, lasts about 10 years, and after that we have to uh, replace the valve again. Uh, having said that, new valves have come about, so this is one of the new valves, uh, which uh, should last longer than that, so potentially we can start using a tissue valve in younger patients. But even then, we still want patients who are younger that if we put in a tissue valve, they, they are likely to need another operation at some stage in the future uh, because the, the valve may not last their lifetime. But if we put it in, in an older patient, uh, 70 years and above, then in most of these uh, patients, this valve is good enough uh, for the rest of their life. So in younger patients, we have the option of a mechanical valve made from uh, matter, and this can last the lifetime of the patient. So this will last longer. Uh, the only disadvantage with mechanical valves is that they need to go on a blood thinning medication called warfarin. Uh, and with this medication, we need to monitor the, uh, the blood tests uh, uh, at least once a month or once every two months. Uh, to get the right amount of medication because if you're on too much of this warfarin, then it can cause bleeding. 
uh, if you have too little of it, then it is not doing the work. It can uh, run the risk of clots forming on the valve. So there is a disadvantage with mechanical valves. You need to go on blood thinning medications. Uh, with the tissue valves from animal tissue, you don't need any additional treatment, uh, but it, it doesn't last uh, 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 more than 15 years. Uh, nowadays, we have a newer uh, device, what we call the transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So we can replace the aortic valve without the need for uh, conventional surgery. So we can actually make a small incision in the groin uh, and then under x-ray guidance and imaging, we can push the, this new valve up uh, the, the aorta, the main, main ves ves this main blood vessel, and then position it just where the aortic valve is. is. We can then uh, stretch the aortic valve and then deploy this, this valve uh, where the narrowed aortic valve is. So this is a new uh, technology called transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Uh, it is a very new technique, uh, and because of that, we do not have long-term results from it. So uh, we are recommending this technique for the older patients uh, and those who have a lot of other uh, medical conditions which would significantly increase their risk of, of uh, conventional aortic valve replacement surgery. So in those whom we feel that the risk of uh, uh, a normal aortic valve surgery is too high, then uh, we can uh, uh, advise this uh, newer treatment option to replace the aortic valve. But for most of the other patients who are younger and uh, in whom we expect to live many, many more years, uh, we would still recommend a, a conventional aortic valve replacement because we know the, the long-term results from a conventional aortic valve replacement. So if we compare the, uh, the survivor, how long patients live after they've had a surgical aortic valve replacement, that is uh, patients who had an aortic valve replacement through the conventional technique uh, uh, versus this newer technique, what we call a TAVI technique, transcatheter aortic valve implantation, uh, we will see that in the first year, patients who have had this new treatment with TAVI, they live longer. So the new treatment is better than the conventional surgery in the first year after treatment in terms of how long the patients will survive. Uh, between one year and up to three years, uh, you can see there's no difference in uh, survival. So those patients who have the conventional aortic valve replacement and those who have this new TAVI procedure, they live uh, just as long. Uh, but beyond three years, uh, we can see that this blue line are those who had TAVI, the new procedure, and this red line is those who had the surgical aortic valve replacement, and this is the incidence of patients who have died. We can see that uh, less of the patients who have had the uh, surgical aortic valve replacement has, have died. More of those who have had the new TAVI procedure have died after three years. So uh, it appears that beyond three years, the standard uh, aortic valve replacement uh, through the conventional surgery is still the better option compared to the newer transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Uh, and that is why we still recommend uh, the normal aortic valve replacement for the uh, patients who are lower risk and in whom we expect to live a very long time. But for the more elderly patients, the, more, the older patients, and in those who have a lot of other medical conditions which will increase the risk of, the, of open surgery, then we would recommend uh, the transcatheter aortic valve implantation or what we call the TAVI uh, procedure. So the take home message from this is that patients uh, with symptoms due to severe aortic stenosis should undergo aortic valve uh, replacement surgery, should undergo urgent uh, aortic valve replacement surgery. Uh, the aortic valve, we, as we mentioned, can also leak what we call aortic regurgitation. Uh, and in these cases, uh, if the patients have got symptoms or if the heart shows signs of enlarging 
or the heart function is called abnormal, then uh, this would be uh, 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 surgery would be, would be recommended at this at this stage. Surgery to replace the aortic valve, similar to what we do for aortic stenosis. So uh, that is heart valve disease. Uh, and now we come on to diseases involving the aorta. So the aorta is this main blood vessel which comes out from the heart, this, blood ve this big vessel here, uh, and this brings blood from the heart to the rest of the, the body. So one of the conditions which can uh, develop is called an aortic dissection. Uh, this is probably one of the... Uh, a few cases where which is a genuine emergency uh, and this is a condition where the aorta has torn uh, you can see here the aorta typically has got three layers uh, and in this con condition one of the layers has torn and so blood tracks in between the two layers of the aorta and the aorta because it's torn it's got very weak and so can rupture at any stage so this is a condition we really need to treat very urgently to prevent the aorta from rupturing completely. Uh, in this condition, these, the typical symptom is that of chest pain or back pain, and the pain is of very, uh, is very severe. It is the worst sort of chest pain which uh, the patient would have ever experienced, because you can imagine a tear in the aorta, that, that's a very uh, painful condition. Uh, it can also cause shortness of breath if blood is started to leak uh, out uh, into the surrounding tissues and the patient can also present with a with fainting episode with a loss of consciousness if the blood supply to the brain has been uh, affected. So the investigation to diagnose this condition is a CT scan uh, and you can see in this uh, CT scan you can see this line here uh, this uh, essentially shows the, the tear in the, in the aorta. So uh, depending on the location of the tear, the treatment options uh, are, are different. So if the tear of the aorta involves uh, this part of the aorta, what we call the descending aorta. So this is the uh, aorta which is uh, away from, uh, from the heart and away after the uh, area where the blood vessels go to the brain. If it involves this part of the aorta, uh, in most cases, fortunately, we can uh, successfully treat this condition just by controlling the blood pressure because the main uh, risk factor for this condition is uh, high blood pressure, hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, and also in some patients who have what we call connective tissue diseases, which lead to a weakening of the aorta. Uh, this can put the, risk, uh, the, the patients at risk of uh, aortic dissection. So in most of the cases, we can successfully control the, uh, this condition with uh, medica medication to control the blood pressure. Uh, however, if the tear involves this part of the aorta, what we call the ascending aorta, which is the front part of the aorta, the part of the aorta which has just uh, left the heart, uh, if the tear involves this part of the aorta, then uh, we need to do surgery to, to replace the aorta because this is the part of the aorta which is most at risk of rupture uh, in this situation. So uh, to replace this, the aorta, essentially we replace it with an artificial material, uh, something like, like this. Uh, this is an artificial graft. We would suture it on uh, one end of it to the heart and the other end to the other end of the aorta. Uh, depending on how much aorta we need to uh, to replace, we can use a graph like this. This particular graph has got a stent which we can put into the uh, the descending part of the aorta as well, and it has got these branches which we can then suture to the uh, blood vessels supplying the neck. So this is the treatment which will be needed for an aortic dissection uh, involving involving the first part of the aorta, the ascending aorta. Uh, if the uh, dissection involves the descending aorta, most of the time we can treat with medication. But if it is a little bit more complicated and if we, t if we find that the uh, dissection is progressing uh, with medication, then we have the option of uh, endovascular treatment, meaning putting a stent 
uh, also through the groin and passing it up to the aorta uh, to exclude the torn part of the aorta. Uh, in, the, in the years gone by, we used to do open surgery for this part of the aorta, but nowadays, uh, if there's a problem involving the descending aorta, either uh, because of a dissection or through an aneurysm, which is a ballooning of the aorta, uh, we tend to treat these conditions uh, by an endovascular technique nowadays. So that means putting uh, an endovascular stent into the uh, blood vessels from the groin and then positioning it into the uh, problem area in the aorta. So the take home message for aortic dissection, aortic dissection involving the ascending aorta is a surgical emergency. Uncomplicated descending thoracic aorta dissection uh, can be managed medically with blood pressure control if it involves the descending aorta. But if it is complicated, then we can have the option of endovascular treatment, what, what we call TEVA, T-E-V-A-R. So that's uh, aortic dissection. So coming to aortic tumors, uh, tumors can also occur in the uh, aorta. It is quite unusual, but it can uh, present as well. Typically, the presenting symptoms is that of chest or back pain, uh, for in, and is diagnosed by CT scan. So here we see a tumor in the uh, descending aorta. Uh, the treatment of this, as with any tumor, depends on the stage of the disease. Uh, if we can completely resect the tumor, then that is the best treatment uh, to uh, remove the part of the aorta with the tumor and replace it with a new part of the aorta. But if it is not uh, resectable, if we cannot completely resect it, then other forms of treatment would be best, such as uh, radio radiation treatment or uh, chemotherapy. So coming on to some of the other conditions uh, which can uh, present like a uh, heart disease. So we have got uh, hyperhidrosis, for example, uh, uh, sweaty hands. Uh, so uh, this refers to severe sweating of the hands and it can affect the, uh, the work with computers and writing. Uh, uh, well, a condition we call severe hyperhidrosis. And uh, different treatments are available. First of all, uh, patients can try lifestyle changes, uh, treatment of anxiety. Uh, they can try antiperspirants or anticholinergics medication uh, treatment. Uh, if that doesn't work, then surgery is also possible. Uh, uh, the reason surgery is possible in this case is because the nerve which controls the, the sweating of the hands actually travels uh, at the back of the chest wall. Uh, and we can divide this nerve uh, which controls the sweating in the hands. And this can uh, then result in uh, a warm and dry hand. And this is uh, possible through a keyhole technique, what we call video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery or VAT surgery. Uh, so this is called VAT sympathectomy, which is cutting the sympathetic nerve. Uh, two small incisions at each side of the, of the, of the chest wall and the sympathetic nerve is divided at two different positions. Uh, it's usually done as a day case. Uh, the patient comes in in the morning and they can, and they can then go home in the evening, uh, but they can stay an additional, additional night if, if uh, required. Uh, the satisfaction rate is high, 95% of the cases are happy with the surgery. A common side effect of this is that there may be increased sweating in other parts of the body or after eating a heavy meal. But most of the patients, 95% of the patients tell us that they are very satisfied with the outcome from this procedure with the dry hands uh, and, the, and the side effects do not, do not affect them very, very much. So another condition which can present uh, similar to heart condition is what is called a pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. And this can happen if the uh, air has leaked out of the lung and then collapsed the lung. You might not be able to see very clearly, but this is a collapsed lung, uh, a, a big pneumo, what we call a pneumothorax. And these patients will also present with chest pain uh, and shortness of breath. 
But typically, these are younger patients, and the diagnosis is there from a chest X-ray. Uh, CT scan will give more detailed information as to what has caused the, the leak. In this case, it's due to what is called a bullet or cyst in the lung, what is called bullous lung disease. Uh, and we can treat this by, again, by vet surgery, by making some small incisions in the side of the chest and uh, resecting the, uh, the problem part of the lung and then uh, putting some powder in to make the lung stick to the chest wall to prevent this uh, from occurring again. Uh, and of course, uh, lung cancer can also uh, present with chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, in this case, of course, the treatment again is dependent on what stage the patient presents with. Uh, in the early stages, uh, lung cancer surgery to remove the part of the lung containing the cancer is the best treatment. But if the cancer is already spread to other structures, uh, then uh, surgery is not the best option. That other treatment is, is available, such as chemotherapy uh, or radiotherapy. So uh, that uh, that is the end of what I've said. I've not been able to cover all the conditions uh, uh, I could cover. Uh, there are some uh, newer treatments available which unfortunately I've not been able to cover. I thought I had some slides in but uh, it seems to have been uh, removed. Uh, we have techniques to, uh, to wrap around supporting structures on the aorta for early aneurysms, uh, what we call the personalized external aortic root support surgery uh, to stabilize the aorta and prevent it from dilating further. Uh, and we have got techniques to, for irregular heartbeats uh, and also uh, various other techniques for uh, heart failure, for example. But I hope, in, uh, obviously, we couldn't cover everything in, in the short time we have available. Hopefully, we may be able to do another session in future where we can cover the uh, uh, other conditions of the heart uh, and also perhaps maybe of the lungs and the chest. Uh, as which, which can present similar to, to heart diseases. Uh, but uh, we have some time for question and answer. And if you have any questions uh, or you, you would like to ask, I would be very happy to, to uh, answer them. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Uh, and thank you to CVSKL and to our supporting partners for arranging this webinar. I hope it has been uh, useful and interesting. Uh, and uh, I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you.